So now we're going to turn to uh, Felucio Facaridi. Um, Dr. Facaridi is CEO of Cardiovascular Solutions of Mississippi. Uh, sorry, I'm just. He is a physician, entrepreneur, and advocate for healthcare justice who spent his formative years in Nigeria and came to America as a teenager. He earned his medical degree from the University of Medicine and Dentistry, New Jersey, Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. He completed an internship and residency in internal medicine at New York Presbyterian Weill Cornell Hospital and fellowships in cardiology, interventional cardiology, and endovascular intervention at Cooper University Hospital in Camden, New Jersey. Thank you, Felucio, for joining us. Um, before we get into our conversation, I'm gonna turn it over to you uh, for a presentation of some of the work you've been doing. Thank you, Mr. Ross. Um, good afternoon from the Mississippi Delta, and it's an honor to follow uh, Mrs. Washington. Um, what an intriguing and insightful conversation. Um, thank you to the organizers and um, I just um, wanna give a special shout out to all the women out there who are affecting change on this historic month um, as we start um, uh, Women's History Month. So I appreciate that. Um, I just wanted to, um, to shed some light on my mission here and my job here, which is basically to highlight disturbing practices occurring in particularly uh, communities of color and low socioeconomic um, communities where you have preventable amputations being performed at a disproportionately high rate. And uh, the disease is called peripheral arterial disease and the management um, of this disease in these patients um, is something that really highlights what systemic racism can do to our healthcare system. Um, I have no disclosures. All patients consented to sharing of their information and pictures in this presentation. Um, it's important to note that there are megatrends that are impacting the cardiovascular field. Uh, we have an aging and growing population with octogenarians being high on the list, prevalence of chronic diseases that predispose, uh, uh, disproportionately affects minorities, um, changes that are coming down the pike in terms of uh, fee-for-service versus value-based care. Uh, we have an aging cardiology healthcare workforce. Uh, with uh, protected shortages, not only within our field, but also the primary care fields um, that also disproportionately affect special regions. And then we have social determinants of health, which includes uh, systemic racism, and then healthcare consolidation in terms of its impact and how monopolies are formed. And so um, when you look at the social determinants of health uh, piece, it's important to understand that health outcomes of patients are determined not only by where you're born, uh, where you live, uh, but also the economic stability, the neighborhoods that surrounds and physical environments that surrounds your, your um, existence and also um, educational equity, the food equity that's available there, community engagement, and as also healthcare coverage. That all determines if you live, if you die, and also determines if your livelihood gets upended. Um, real brief history on Mississippi. Cotton was king in Mississippi, as we all know, um, with uh, Mississippi being the fourth wealthiest, the fourth wealthiest region uh, during slavery. Um, and that, uh, unfortunately, that history has an enduring legacy today with 40% of its population um, still being uh, black, um, the highest of any state. Uh, unfortunately, it's um, also been decimated with the highest poverty rate. Uh, low per capita income, uh, the lowest number of physicians per capita in the country, uh, low literacy level, and uh, lowest life expectancy levels. One in three black patients in the state are uninsured. We have a total of about 516,000 out of the 3 million residents of Mississippi. Um, Mississippi has yet to elect a black candidate to statewide office um, since um, 1890, and we have the highest proportion of vulnerable rural hospitals with seven counties that lack access to care. And we have less than 10 endocrinologists in the state of Mississippi. Why is that important? Well, the two unique health challenges that will pose um, the greatest health burden to our healthcare system are diabetes and obesity, also known as the diabetes epidemic. 
And Mississippi has ranked in the top three uh, ca- uh, rankings of, of those categories since uh, its uh, inception um, in terms of documentation based on research. Um, and majority of these diseases are taken care of and are um, need to be addressed and assessed by specialists, endocrinologists being one of them for diabetes. And we only have about eight in the whole state. Um, this addresses some of the lack of access to care in terms of diabetes management within the state and why primary care physicians are left with that burden in addition to other burdens of taking care of the diabetes management for a lot of the residents. In the next two decades, Black Americans will have the highest rates of cardiovascular disease. And if you look at the burden of health in America from 1990 to 2018, we've seen a 36% decline in mortality and death and morbidity in these patients. However, we've yet to see the same equitable uh, uh, percentages achieved, especially in regions like Mississippi and in other communities where you have high percentage of uh, minorities. So this is a 54 year old mechanic who I saw uh, when I came to start my practice here in 2015, history of diabetes, hypertension, and tissue disease on hemodialysis made about $39,000 a year, had three kids. Um, Prior to my presentation um, to to this region, he had his right grade toe amputated, and then he had a non-healing ulcer that was treated by a wound care center and um, did not have any prior vascular evaluation, which is important for anyone who has poor circulation. You'll need to see what's going on with the vascular tree to determine if you can um, uh, basically uh, open up all those blockages before an amputation is performed. And that also enables uh, things like, you know, your antibiotics and other things that are used to treat the wound to actually get to the end organ. And here, this is an image where we spent about an hour, hour and a half, opened up the blood vessels to his legs um, and his feet. And I fly out of town that Friday and I come back that Tuesday and the patient has had an amputated leg. This happened under my watch. And that's when I decided to fight this injustice because if a patient can get undergo an amputation after a physician performs a, a successful revascularization, what happens when such physicians are not around? Um, so we have regional variability in delivery of care if you look at the amputation rates in the country. On the left, you see that we have um, the highest rates of amputation in the Medicare population, predominantly in the South, which also overlaps with the Black Census Scope of America, uh, which is in the middle. And if you look at the right, you see that the lowest number of procedures that are are done to save and and salvage limbs are also uh, uh, least done in the same region. Hence, your highest amputation rates in in, in terms of uh, the Black census scope of America. Even the U.S. Surgeon General posted this a day before um, he left office, asking why our U.S. healthcare system spends $800 million a year on amputations, um, but uh, we fail to spend the same equitable dollars to prevent or address the preventative side of diabetes that leads to amputation in the first place. And so peripheral arterial disease is the circulatory deficiency that we've basically talked about the last couple of minutes. It affects 20 million Americans that we know of. Um, It has uh, been documented as the most prevalent, most deadly, uh, most costly disease state that most Americans have never heard of. Uh, Most people have heard of cancer and it's similar to peripheral arterial disease in that they're both slow, they're progressive and they're deadly. And if not caught on time, they can lead to death. Uh, Death rates from peripheral arterial disease and its end stage are worse than most cancers. Um, On the right, you see breast cancer, skin cancer, and prostate cancer, um, which actually are less than peripheral arterial disease, um, which is very disconcerting. Um, It's also disconcerting that we have an extremely prevalent numbers of peripheral arterial disease that we're seeing in our aging population, in our diabetic population, and also in our obese population. Again, the diabetes population. The co-prevalence of the number one killer of Americans, which is cardiovascular disease among peripheral arterial disease patients is one of the highest, six times higher. And the patient makeup are also getting larger. 
diabetic population, we have 34 million that are diabetic and 80 million that are pre-diabetic. Your chronic kidney patients, 37 million in the US, majority of whom are African-Americans. Um, your rates of diabetes in the African-American population actually um, is actually 55 to 60% um, higher chance of a, of a black patient becoming a diabetic than a white patient. Smokers, um, one of the leading preventable causes of death. But what's unknown in the literature is we don't document how many African-Americans dip, chew, or vape, right? Uh, that is equ equitable when it comes to uh, exposure to nicotine. So why is diabetes so impactful in this state? Most patients preserve with severe ischemia, meaning a severe form of the disease. They present with more ulcers and gangrene at onset. Um, they're less to get screened. Um, their, their rates of amputation increases with age and severity um, of, in terms of what um, part of their limbs actually gets amputated and the contralateral limb as well. Um, as high as 28X amputation rates that are higher. Um, and you have an increased cost with majority of these diabetics getting diagnosed now at a younger age. Why is it slow and progressive? Because most of these patients just don't have the symptoms that you typically see in patients who have um, your onset of pain, numbness, or their limbs given out. These patients come in with just subtle symptoms and they're not picked on time. And by the time they're picked on and at the time that they're diagnosed, they lead to critical limb ischemia, uh, which is the end form where you see a non-healing wound, an ulcer, or you get rest pain um, and also pain on exertion. Um, these patients have a very high rates of having adverse cardiovascular outcomes. And so what is the pathway to an amputation? A major amputation occurs frequently as the first therapy offered to patients who have end-stage peripheral arterial disease. The national average is about 50 to 70%. Here in a state like Mississippi, 90% of amputees have never had um, any type of workup before an amputation. And usually this workup entails an angiogram. Despite the fact that an angiogram decreases the odds of an amputation by 90%, majority of patients are not offered one. And this is unacceptable in 2021. Now, an amputation versus revascularization is determined by your socioeconomic status, but also what I call the amputation lottery, where you are and where you live. Uh, if you're a female, if you're a minority, um, your hospital volume in terms of how much cases they do in terms of limb salvage work versus amputations. And then if you're poor and if you're um, a Medicaid or Medicare patient versus a commercial uh, patient in terms of insurance. And the evils of amputation actually should not go ignored. A majority of these patients cannot walk uh, with significant uh, reduced quality of life. And it takes these patients out of the workforce of the communities they live in. You have a high mortality rate periprocedurally. And majority of these amputees are not discharged home and they go to nursing home or rehab facilities where reimbursements actually come to play in terms of what's reimbursed versus not. In addition, the general cost of caregiving is estimated um, lifetime to be close to 500 to 800,000 for a patient. And you can only imagine if these amputations are occurring as in regions that are poorest, um, there's no fair fight in terms of who wins that battle. Um, there's a high mortality rate, 80% of amputees are dead within five years and 95% live with chronic pain. And we all know we have a chronic pain issue in this country. So when I moved here, um, our goal was to try, to try to see how we can avoid amputation as a first line treatment for patients. Facilitating this goal is to basically see what predictors of amputation exist, take a holistic approach, identifying the risk factors, design an effective and alternative pathway, and to see what we can do. And what we did was in terms of screening and performing angiograms before an amputation in patients with critical ischemia, we're able to decrease the amputation rate significantly by 88% over this four year period. And the picture on the right basically shows these are limbs of patients who came to my office where you tell them to take off their socks and you just look at their feet. These patients, majority of whom have never been told that they need to take off their socks. 80% of patients on this screen are diabetics. Um, 
And just take note of, of, of this one on the left, actually, because I'll get to this, this, this patient shortly. However, the US Preventive Service Task Force is a portfolio of services to improve the health of all Americans based on evidence-based recommendations with the CMS providing full coverage for their ratings of A or B. And what they've done is to determine what internal medicine of family practitioners should screen. We know this for cancer, right? We all screen for cancer, a majority of our cancers. But what about these patients who we've just talked about? Well, they said that there is insufficient data to, bet to, to determine the benefits and harms of screening patients who are asymptomatic and screening the general population for PED. Well, that's not who we're interested in. We're only interested in patients who are considered at risk. If you're diabetic, if you're over an age of 50, you've had a history of nicotine use, you've had a history of other atherosclerotic burden, other beds like your heart, or you've had a stroke, those are patients who are at risk, or if you have chronic kidney disease or high blood pressure, but they fail to do that. And so their comments, these are their words, these comments cite that the evidence that the prevalence of PAD is disproportionately higher among racial and ethnic minorities and low socioeconomic populations. And we note that the I statement could discourage testing and perpetuate disparities in treatment and outcomes. These are well-established disparities in care. However, the evidence on screening and treatment in these groups is currently lacking, and the USPSTF is unable to determine the overall balance of benefits and harms. Future research should include diverse populations and report their outcomes. Well, we have a problem with that last statement. So if you look at research in all the cardiovascular space, as Dr. Washington has alluded to, um, minorities are underrepresented. This is a typical trial, a complex trial of a drug called Xarelto um, that's well known, rivaroxaban in a vascular dose, where patients who have peripheral arterial disease and coronary artery disease, meaning blockages in your legs and your heart, actually had mortality benefit by using this drug. A great drug, multinational trial. They had 27,000 patients, and guess how many Black patients they could enroll? 162. I'm correction, 262 patients. That is unacceptable. If we carry the car largest cardiovascular burden, you can only find 262 patients in a 27,000 patient trial. Not to mention, if you look at all the trials from whence we've come from, African-Americans, 12% of the US population, but only 5%. Hispanics, 1%, even though they carry close to about 20% now in terms of their growing population. Uh, women underrepresented in cardiovascular trials. Uh, this is unacceptable. And what about the cost of some of these medicines that are used in these to, 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 to treat these patients in the office? We know that cardiovascular prevention and PAD is important, and these prevention start strategies are somewhat underused, but there's a reason why the patients cannot afford the medicines. Look at the cost. In the state of Mississippi with the median income, I told you it's about 36 to $38,000. If you're on a Medicaid, maybe you can afford it. But what if you're in Medicare and you did not meet your deductible? Well, you're in, in it for a long haul in terms of the cash price, but also you have an issue if that med deductible is met, you still have to pay close to about $100 a month if you have a Part D plan. Let's talk about heart failure. Heart failure also overlaps that map that I just mentioned in terms of the regional variability where African-Americans carry that burden of cardiovascular disease. You have at least a 20X higher incidence of heart failure among black men and women compared with white men and women before age you know, 50. And African-Americans and Hispanics have a higher burden of modifiable risk factors. And those risk factors are what I mentioned, diabetes and hypertension, chronic kidney disease. But the cost to take care of these patients with a drug that's known to have mortality benefit, it's significant, significant, especially if these patients fall into the donut hole, majority of whom, my patients, 75% whom, whom are on Medicare, do fall into it with an average cost of about $176 per month. And let's take this, for example. We have a drug that is known to have significant um, reduction in cardiovascular outcomes um, that basically um, was well, known as a PCSK9 inhibitor. Um, it's uh, known um, as Rapata. Um, and it's known to decrease actually cardiovascular risk twofold in African-Americans versus white subjects. 
So that's a good, that's a good drug. However, look at the cost of the drug when it first came out. I mean, we're talking about a cost where the reduction in costs went by 60% from an annual price of 14,100 down to 5,850. That is significant. And so when you get upset and when you see despair, um, sometimes despair is right a poor chisel to carve out tomorrow's justice. You get involved and you, I got involved in policy. And there's this patient who I met, Mrs. Gertrude Campbell. Um, she unfortunately um, got an amputation at the age of 72. Um, she had been a diabetic since the age of 54. Um, she had not had appropriate screening prior to that because the USPSTF did not have guidelines to screen patients like her. Um, she um, got her left leg amputated. And when she came to see me to treat the stump of the left leg, I told her to take her socks off and her right leg had already become a gangrene leg. So I took, she lost her leg actually in 2015. And on, um, we took her to Congress to tell her story in 2018. Um, or as um, the PAD chair for the Association of Black Cardiology, as well as other stakeholders, we testified as to this sprint to zero effort where no one should lose their legs and these violent practices of amputation should stop. And so the PAD caucus was established in 2019 with the goal of educating Congress and the communities as to why it's important uh, to know about research strategies and policy strategies that need to be um, enforced um, for patients um, who lack a voice. And Representative uh, Payne Jr. from New Jersey and Bill Rockus from Florida um, basically started the PAD caucus. And through this caucus, legislation was introduced basically to raise awareness on peripheral arterial disease, which only one in four Americans has ever heard of to authorize funding to establish and coordinate a PD educational program. Um, cost sharing uh, should not be an issue in terms of screening for patients who we consider at risk um, under this provision known as the Amputation Reduction and Compassion Act. And basically we should disincentivize non-emergent amputations that are performed without appropriate testing and that do not fit, fit the guidelines or the exception rules and also to have kind of a QI method to, um, to go through uh, HHS to reduce amputations relating to PAD. And so in closing, um, a wish list. The wish list is that, you know, basically we need to stop using um, this line from 1966. And that line is that of all forms of inequity, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. That was by Dr. Martin Luther King because it leads to unpreventable deaths. And that is a line that we should not be using despite all the advancements in technology and all the access to, um, to all the research that has gone into uh, developing drugs that we know have mortality benefit. Um, we should have a unified health justice kind of humanity awareness campaign where we need to have basically equity for all when it comes to access, not only to care, but access to quality care. We need to address the social determinants of health peace. Uh, we need to support passages of legislation, such as the ARC Act, where we know that appropriation measures and reconciliation legislation are in place to stop this inhumane and violent practices of preventable amputations. And we need to standardize collect more data, standardized data representing the local snapshot of racial um, the racial and ethnic based disparities in care and PAD being an example. Um, what's, what's the number by race and by gender in Mississippi for African-Americans versus Hispanics versus a Tennessee versus West Virginia versus Arkansas. And then we have to incentivize and re, uh, the recruitment and retention of specialists um, to the field um, and uh, to rural areas with evidence of QI interventions and programs using evidence-based medicine to affect outcomes. And monopolies have to be addressed, not only in terms of um, health uh, healthcare consolidation, but also in the pharmaceutical world as well. So uh, thank you for your time.
Thank you, Felicia, for a very powerful presentation. Um, you've, you've laid out some, some really stunning disparities in, in care and in access. Uh, I guess my first maybe simple question for you is outside of the PAD caucus, what kind of reaction are you getting um, from folks or is it still sort of too early to, to tell? Yeah, so we are um, we're basically at a phase now where um, you know, we've had some co-sponsors of the bill. Um, the Cardiovascular Coalition um, is leading that effort. Um, and um, I think right now we're just trying to get societies to, to be on board. One has to understand that the fragmentation of care is also a problem, whereby you have someone like myself who's an interventional cardiologist, but also this problem is also being addressed by an interventional radiologist and a vascular surgeon. We all have societies and all those societies have to come together and say enough is enough, share one concerted effort to not only help raise awareness, just like the oncological space did, they got it right, right? So if you think of cancer, they got it right. When you look at commercials, it doesn't say, well, stage four versus stage one, like let's, let's have this debate. No, cancer is cancer. We need to raise awareness on peripheral arterial disease. We need to mobilize every resource we can and publicize why this is unacceptable in 2021. Um, we need to go to policymakers and with the backing of all our societies in a one unified voice to say, this affects the clinical, economical and human impact of our healthcare system. It's a $252 billion a year cost. And do you know who carries that cost? Mr. Ross, it's you and I taxpayers, 80% 80, 80 of that bill is borne by taxpayers. So irrespective of where you are politically, left, right, middle, you know, it's, it, this affects your, your bottom line. And 80% to 90% of these cases are preventable. So why don't we focus on upstream and let's try, try to work in appropriate screening strategies for those who are at risk and not think of a 25 year old Who's, who we think is gonna come in with peripheral arterial disease. We don't think of 25 year olds with breast cancer, for instance, we think of an older population. Well, it's a similar mentality here. When a woman presents to a physician's office with a potential mass or lump in, in the breast tissue, it should not lead straight to a mastectomy without appropriate treatment. You have to diagnose, get the pathology, get screening and ultrasound, mammo, they're just steps that need to be taken. The same concept here. You don't just go straight to chopping off people's limbs and lives because their lives matter and their limbs matter as well. So yeah, we'll see where, where things go. I think we're going to reintroduce this bill and, and whatever support we can get from all policymakers. Um, I think that's, uh, that's more than welcome. Well, we hear you loud and clear on, on addressing social determinants. The other the other thing you mentioned is the, the you know, the, the fragmentation of care delivery. And so I, I can put in a plug for the integrated delivery system that is hosting this forum, but um, life's a little bit different in the Delta in Mississippi. And I just, you know, what are your, what do you do in Mississippi to improve coordination? <laughs> you know what, <laughs> that's a, that, that's a great question. Um, it's hard. Why is it hard? Um, it's hard because um, as a 40 year old cardiologist who lives in the Mississippi Delta, I can tell you that um, the last time a cardiovascular specialist was recruited to the Delta was in 2012. All right. <laughs> and so the last time um, I saw a podiatrist, a full term, a full time residential podiatrist in the Delta, was about five years ago. Um, and if you look at the landscape in terms of the landscape of not only from a, you know insurance standpoint, you know it's it's not because every you know out of the three million, yeah, sure, there are five hundred and sixteen thousand that are uninsured. Um, there are about seven hundred and seven to eight hundred thousand that are in Medicaid. The rest have between commercial and Medicare. So it's not an insurance issue. Yeah, reimbursement rates might vary compared to someone who lives in, you know, who works at UCSF or at Columbia or, you know, or somewhere in, you know, Alpine, New Jersey. But it's just that you have, you know, this, um, this, this, this lack of specialty care 
in the granular areas and in especially in rural areas where there isn't much to do. These are places that are deserts, food deserts, but literally it's, you wanna get a Starbucks coffee, you gotta drive two hours. So try and get a physician who's a specialist to bypass a big urban city like a Memphis or Jackson or Oxford to come to a rural area. It's very hard and challenging. Our policymakers do not incentivize specialists like myself to come and start a practice who are not recruited by hospitals. I don't know if you know this. If you're a cardiologist, you cannot come here unrecruited and get assistance with your loan forgiveness program, for instance. You have to go through a hospital system. Well, if we were to just bring up the hospitals and say, what are the, what's the hospital climate in the state of Mississippi? Well, it's not that great. I'll tell you that much. Unless you're a big university care center, um, all of these critical access hospitals are not only vulnerable, but you know we have about 51 that threatened to close out of the 130, 140. Um, there are seven counties in this whole state that do not have any type of health care coverage, seven counties. I don't know any other state that can mirror this. <laughs> so um, how, do you, how do we fix these problems? These are intergenerational problems and that, that actually need to bring all systems in play in terms of on the state level, local level, and national level. And then societies have to see how they can try and incentivize some of their trainees to come to rural areas rather than send all our trainees out to you know, Doctors Without Borders to international countries because we have a big problem here in the States. You, you touched on this in your presentation, but I'll just, I just want to come back to it. Um, you know, we're having a lot of conversations about drug pricing in, in this country now, but we aren't hearing a lot about racial equity in the context of those conversations. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could just tell us, you know, the, the connection between high drug prices and racial equity and, and why it's important to discuss it. Sure. Um... It, it, it has a lot to play if you look at, um, just for instance, if you look at the, the chronic diseases um, that, um, that plague um, in the cardiovascular space. So I can, let, me, let me just talk about just cardiovascular disease and some of those med med medications that I mentioned, um, high blood pressure, um, heart failure, uh, obesity, diabetes, diabetes epidemic. So you look at medications that are coming that address not only the diabetes aspect, but now some of these diabetes meds are used to treat cardiovascular diseases. Um, we're seeing that with, with what we call SGL2 L2, uh, inhibitors in heart failure treatment. And so when you, when you start seeing these treatments for these patients, the cost to take care of a patient who presents to my practice, 80% of whom are African-Americans. There are a lot of things that I that have to go through my head. And here, here, here they are. For a patient to drive 40 minutes to, 50, to an hour to come and see a specialist, they have to pay. Some of them have to pay a family member to bring them here or a friend. Why? Because they live in rural areas where the, 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 the sole provider in that family has to work on that day. And so they have to pay about 20 to 30 bucks, right? Come to see me. They have multiple medical issues. And then out of those issues, you give them a prescription pad and say, yes, I need to go to your pharmacy. And their assumption is that everything's a $4 drug at Walmart. Well, it's not. There, there, there are actually within pharmacies, the generic pricing actually vary, <laughs> which is, you know, which, which, which again seeks to, who are the ones controlling the price points, right? Um, do I do I do I do I do I have to call the local pharmacy? Do I have to call you know a PBM? You know to, to figure out how we arrive to this price point. Um, to, and not not only that, what happens to this patient when they go home and realize that not only are their copays high, but now they have other physicians they have to visit for their other comorbidities. And how do they afford this in the context of not having access to high paying jobs where they have Medicaid recipients that are limited to five drugs that they have to choose from that to, to have covered before they go into that paying out of pocket um, uh, uh, option. That in itself is what, what, what you see gets played out where patients come back and say, well, doc, guess what? 
I had to decide what to do, keep the lights on versus to take my medicine. And they're labeled as non-compliant. And when you're labeled as non-compliant and your patient has chronic kidney disease and you are put on that, you know, that, that list for a transplant, kidney transplant, and you miss one of your appointments because of either a transportation issue or you don't take a medication and your label is not adherent, guess what? You don't get your kidney transplant. And when you don't get your tr- kidney transplant, you die. Or when you don't get those medicines from a cardiovascular standpoint, you end up in the hospital system. And in the hospital system, the cost to take care of the patient in the hospital far exceeds taking care of that patient as an outpatient. And they get stuck with that bill. Yep. And the mistrust between these hospitals that do not engage these communities as spoken before because of this deep rooted mistrust that preceded Tuskegee. And thank God someone said, we need to talk about things other than Tuskegee because I'm, 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 I also get, get tired of just put, talking about just Tuskegee. Things occurred way beyond Tuskegee, right? And that deep rooted mistrust is what needs to, be, needs to be addressed. The sharing of power, the decision-making and the willingness to examine new ways of doing things is what I had to think about. And I think community engagement is what I had to do, direct to consumer approach to kind of explain all these levels to patients. So we're, we're, we're running up against uh, time here. I, I just want to ask, um, cause I remember taking it when I was in government, taking a team to the Delta and that same issue of transportation and, you know, I don't have a car or my husband had to go to work, so I got to pay the neighbor. And that was a, a significant barrier. Um, in, 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 I don't know, 60 seconds or less, how much does telehealth help us? And again, how much does it help in the Delta? <laughs> The gift and the curse. Um, COVID unblinded a lot of disparities, and telehealth is actually one of them, right? It might, might be shocking to a lot of people, but the realities are um, 50% of my patients do not have access to the internet. Why is this important now? It's important because most of these patients actually cannot go online and register for the vaccines. These sites require you to have some form of access, right? And there's a phone number you can call now. The state has a phone number, but the majority is download an app or download more 50% don't have access to an internet. And most of these patients do not have access to a smartphone. And so telehealth has helped some in terms of patients who might have access to an internet and what have you. But in terms of our field and examining someone's wound and, and taking off your socks and checking your circulation and putting my finger on your circulation, it's hard to do that over the phone or via Zoom or FaceTime because I need to be able to palpate that pulse. I need to be able to tell you if that's, that's concerning or not. I need to be able to examine if you're losing your hair. I need to tell you if that foot is cooler than another. And so um, there are some benefits, especially when it comes to specialty care coordination, where I as a physician can discuss a patient's case with other physicians and other specialists. But also, there are also, you know, the flip side of that is, you know, there are people in the community who just don't have access. Um, and that is one piece that we need to address, a big piece, because telehealth is here to stay. Access to internet bandwidth, smartphones, and how to make sure that, you know, that trust, because some of the information people feel you're taking from telehealth, there's this mistrust that is being taken and used against them in some other form. And in, in communities of color, that's something that you also have to have to have to address. Well, thank you, Dr. Fakariti. You have given us a, a pretty big to-do list here um, to to address all these issues. But we appreciate the the, the rich conversation. Um, thank you to the audience for submitting questions. We've reached the end of our time, but before I close, I just wanted to remind folks that this event has been recorded, and we will post the videos on kpihp.org in the coming weeks. And again, you may also view the recording of our previous event on pharmaceutical funding and investment on our, the same website. We're very interested in your feedback on this event and we'll send you an evaluation and also ask you to share topics or issues that you'd like to see covered in the future. And with that, I'll thank everyone for joining us today. And I, my thanks to Harriet Washington and uh, Dr. Fakariti and to Dr. Copeland. Um, great, great to have your participation. Thanks everyone.